a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Clark Stell. Uh, Professor Stell received his bachelor's degree at Emory University in 1972 and his PhD at Emory with Professor David Goldsmith in 1973. After a postdoctoral work at Princeton with Professor Tom Whitkey, he was a postdoctoral fellow with Gilbert Stork from 1975 to 1976. He began his independent academic career at Vanderbilt in 1976, but returned here to Columbia in 1977 to join the faculty of the chemistry department. Uh, here at Columbia, uh, Professor Stowe made significant contributions to the field uh, of organic chemistry, particularly in the area of natural product synthesis, reaction development, conformational analysis, macroscopic stereo control, and computational chemistry. Uh, still developed the integrated software program Macro Model in 1986 in association with Columbia University. Uh, Macro Model was acquired by Schrodinger in 1998 and is now offered as a full featured program for molecular modeling. Professor Still, Professor Still also developed methods for synthesizing chemical libraries and resin beads using molecular tags. It became the foundation for the premier combinatorial chemistry company, Pharmacopia, which he co-founded in the early 1990s. Uh, Professor Still retired in 1998, was distinguished professor at Columbia. And he, uh, uh, Professor Still organized uh, the Stork Symposium here at Columbia in 1992. It's great to have you back uh, here today. You, you forgot my greatest contribution. Uh-oh. Flash from the
shows a very simple compound as, a, as an example. Cantheridin, and he made it by hydrophil alder reactions, and it specifically produced only the right stereoisomer. Admittedly, this is, this is uh, uh, I guess it, it's probably, like, I assume it's, it's, it's DL, but it gives only the, the cantheridin structure. Obviously, hard to get much more than this because it's pretty strange. This was the first example of um, a uh, synthesis, stereospecific synthesis designed with a natural product. Should also be noted later, sort as you see down here, that Sarah and Burke published just a year later the first stereoselective synthesis of a complex natural product that is cortisol. After that, he started becoming interested in how it is that nature makes some of the compounds. And in particular, he studied a uh, work by uh, Lindstedt in the 30s. He found out that there was stereoselectivity involved in its light emission to one by dying. In connection with work by uh, Bert, both in his lab and also, they came up with a, with a concept called the Sporkesh and Moser hypothesis that there is a stereospecific anti parallel addition of armenium ions to an alkene. And then that was followed later on. As, as everyone knows, for making polyenes into steroids, um, uh, terpenes, many other things, very good, which turned out in the end to be very efficient. This is a long time between this, 1950s, and 1994. About the same time, Stork uh, at Columbia with Bergstaller made some proposals about how one can get things like tricycloterpenes and steroids from squalene. This is just a picture from one of his papers from 1995. You can see that it has as a terpene example, or cholesterol or cholesterol down here as a steroid example. Now this is an interesting structure. I've seen, seen pictures of sedrine and sedrol all around the place. In fact, there was some out, out in front. Didn't realize that it turns out that Stork and Breslow proposed the structure of Sedrol. They didn't really know much about it, but they had a, they had a connectivity. They didn't really have a stereochemical proposal. So the proposal was in the in the journal for about a year, journals, and then Stork and Hill in 1950, sorry, Stork and uh, Clark in 1955 did a total synthesis of both of these things. And in doing that, established that the structures that were proposed by Breslau and Stork were correct, but also what the stereochemistry of Sedrol and Sedrine were. Later on, uh, he went back to other things like alkaloids, uh, total synthesis of aloe yohimbine, and then later on, as I say, 15 years later, he made yohimbine itself, which is, which is this molecule. Among the natural products work that he did in the 60s were uh, a number of alkaloids and also things like um, uh, steroids down here at the bottom. Particularly, Sork tended to produce a method that he was really interested in. Generally a new method, and that method would be used to create one or maybe lots of different examples with the same methodology. So these are just a couple of examples of fairly complex uh, alkaloids. And then this one was interesting because we used the so-called isoxazole methylation method, where this moiety, which is a kind of a masked 1,3-diketone, could be used and opened up and put together to make large polycyclic systems like you see here for progesterone. Um, one of the things which I think was for a long time the hallmark of Wilbert's work was the fact that he liked to create stereochemistry by uh, an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl system. Uh, and he found out that lithium and ammonia makes transfusions. And that leaves a specific enolate which one can add something to. The program you can get this, you can add an electrophile and probably get stereochemical control here as well. Um, or you can track the enolate as a side of the ether. There are a lot of examples of this in his work. Uh, this is the, uh, the one where he talked mainly about sidereal ethers, and in fact, this was the first <coughs> use of the dimethyl T butyl sidereal protecting for at least for England. Um, and then later on, one discovered that you could get other stereochemistry with cuprate reactions on things like this. 
This generally produces cis fusions, lithium ammonia, normally transfusions. Anyway, this methodology had a lot going for it because you could, you could put in something at the back, either a hydrogen or an alkyl group, then get an enol agent, put in something next, next to it uh, for forming more Uh, there is a, there's a question I keep, I keep running into it relates to dimethyl butyl chlorocyanate protecting group. And there was a uh, statement which said that the dimethyl butyl protecting group, cyanide protecting, was introduced to organic chemistry by Stork. And it was alleged to be in a paper by Ian Fleming. Ian Fleming. I couldn't find that paper. But Ian Fleming has a pretty long publication list, what a surprise. So I sent him an email. And he responded and said, yes, it's been a very long time. Nice to see you. And in fact, it is, I did say that, and this is the reference. And so this is one of, one of them. And this is exactly what Ian Fleming said. Ian Fleming. I had to, sorry, I had a neighbor who is, is called Ian. And now I'm very confused. So I'm, I'm using these in a any case, according to Fleming, Stork definitely was the one who introduced the T-butyl dimethyl silo protecting group uh, to organic chemistry. But of course, it was terribly important that it could be used for alcohols, as Corey uh, found out, and that you could remove it with fluoride ion without affecting other functional groups. Now, so here's an example of using this kind of technology where you do something like a lithium ammonia reduction track with another thing, and it was used to make this compound, this tetracyclic terpene uh, lupiol. First reduction, first reactions, put a cyclopropane in here. That can also be reduced by lithium, lithium and ammonia. You cleave that bond, that leaves a methyl group right here, axial, opposite to that, and leaves an enol that you can add something to, like methyl ion. So this group of things, those two substituents were essentially put in by this lithium ammonia reduction to generate an e in fact. It gets used here again, I'm not going through the details, used here again to put the hydrogen in, that's the normal uh, trans uh, fusion, and then trap it with allyl bromide, that's this. This then becomes that part over here and it's done yet a third time. So the same methodology is over and over to generate pretty complex natural products. Very high spirit of chemical control. It was also used um, to make prostaglandins. There was a time in the 70s when prostaglandins, is, as we all remember, were very popular to make. Gilbert did a number of these things. Um, one of the neatest ones, I thought, was the one down here. It starts with deglyceraldehyde to get that chiral center. There's then a, a Michael reaction where you add a enolate and or add the cuprate of this to give the uh, to give to give the, the beta substituted carbonyl compound. This ends up on the more stable side, which is opposite from that on the 500 ring. But the interesting thing is because Stork was associated with syntax at times and knew some people there like Carl Bunch, he knew there was a way to stay, to take a sisal the wrong stereochemistry and convert that to a trans olefin with the right stereochemistry. So it even turned out that in this particular case, if you made a cuprate out of this, even if it's not stereocontrolled, it's just for semen, only one of them really reacts well. And that's the one that gives the right stereochemistry for prostaglandin uh, E1. Now this is a couple of papers, I don't really even going over my time here, but this is just a couple of papers which I think is spectacular. Scott Ignatsky, is he here today? Oh, uh, yes. He's <laughs> obviously going to remember this. Developed in a method, and there's a two part, there's a two paper back to back Jack's communication set. One in which he shows that you can make all the possible bias barriers of this little butenolide, and that they can then be put together to extend it to make a new butene line, and then do it over and over. And that basically was done by Rignosky uh, in the second Jack's communication to make uh, the erythromycin ring system. 
for one person doing all of this all by himself, except for Gilbert, who is not known for working well on the cab. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. But I thought this was spectac spectacular. Um, he also did a lot of free radical cyclizations. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I, I, I am running over, but just to point out, free radical cyclizations were not really used that much in chemistry, but Stork found out you could do things like you kick off a free radical cyclization here, that adds to the double, the triple bond, leaves a free radical there, and that adds to here. So this is all these rings are zipped up by one free radical cyclization. Another one is here. In, uh, in the conversion of the cyclopentenol derivative to prostaglandin F2 alpha. Uh, we also use the same idea to make gelsamine. I'm just going to just divide. The point is, he really creates, creates reactions that other people didn't use very much or know much about. Find out what they can do and then use them over and over. And the neat thing about these geographical cyclizations is anytime you can make several rates in one, one go. Finally, the uh, Jeremy, uh, his last paper, last project, um, huge amount of work. Uh, it, it was going on for, for many years, but Ayako uh, Yamashita obviously had to make the whole thing work, do the finished part, and have to go through the whole synthesis herself to get enough material. Um, the neat thing is that that one chiral center, unlike putting Getting lots of chiral centers from the chiral pool, that one chiral center controls the formation of 15 millions. That is an unbelievable, an unbelievable, amazing thing. Unfortunately, by the time they got to the end or running out of material, the compound they had had an extra methylene right there. This really ought to be an OH. Uh, so there's, there is a statement by Sport, you can see it down here. Where it explains why, why exactly this he didn't finish and get rid of that, get rid of that defending part of could have, could have done it if he had more time. In any case, I just want to show one more slide and thank the people who have helped me. Amayako told me a lot about the uh, journey work. Um, I've known her for many years. My Fleming um, helped clarify the issue about dimethyl silane and cuprate. And I believe this man, Noah Burns, I think he was a, an undergraduate here. And he worked with um, Jim Layton. Jim Layton, yeah, that here. In any case, he wrote a wonderful review. This is worth looking at. It's a review of Gilbert's career. Got lots of structures. I took a lot of, a lot of material from that. Anyway, it's a spectacular work. He's now at Stanford and understands it very well. Thank you. Thank you very much.